Okay, Tom Nacella, Chief Strategy Officer with Embrain. And uh, today I'm just going to talk about the architecture or the co functional components of the Embrain Helio system and then we're going to dive into a demo and uh, I'll use that as a bit of a, a teaching tool to go through the different pieces of the solution. So the first thing we start off with in, in the, uh, the building blocks of the model is virtualized x86 resources. So these are servers that have hypervisors running on them. Uh, <clears throat> today we support three hypervisors. We support ESXi version 4.0 or 4.1 and up. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're dropping 4.1, so we're basically 5x. Uh, we support uh, Zen server as well. Uh, and finally, we also support, as of our last release, uh, KVM. Now, these resources need to have a basic, it, it, I'll, I'll focus a little bit more on the VMware scenario because that's the one we run into most often. We're not leveraging any of the built-in features that you would typically hear of in ESXi or vSphere hypervisors. So we're not using HA, we're not using fault tolerance, DRS, things like that. We're actually building most of those from a more network-centric point of view in the ESM, which I'll talk about in a minute. So those, those VMware resources only need the basic standard license installed on them. They don't need Enterprise, they don't need Enterprise Plus. We really wanted to keep the, pr the entry price to these things as low as we could. I'll talk about how we do HA from more of a network-centric point of view between appliances rather than leveraging things like fault tolerance or vMotion or things like that. The other thing I don't show in the picture here is vCenter. So the re and none of the, the, the VMware-specific resources here do not require vCenter. However, if you have it, which is the case in most enterprises, we can actually speak to vCenter directly or to the hypervisors directly. So it, it, it's, it's the customer's choice. If we talk to the vCenter um, instance directly, it'll tell us about the resources that are available and we can use them through vCenter. Now the ESM communicates with them. So the ESM needs to have some sort of network connectivity directly to the hypervisor. Uh, you would set up a user account on those hypervisors that the ESM uses to, to uh, con contact and manage those, those resources. In the case of VMware, because that's the one, again, I've spent the most time on, there, at least last I looked, which was version 5.0, there were about 250 some on unique permissions that you could give to a user on the hypervisor. We need 17 of them. So we don't need full root access, although most customers commonly do that. Um, we just need a very small subset of, of the, the capabilities in the role that's assigned to the ESM. So it'll contact those resources through their APIs and manage uh, the, the different features within there, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now the ESM uses those resources to spin up a series of virtual appliances. So as was mentioned, we have uh, our own virtual appliances. The f we have a firewall with, S with uh, IPsec VPN built into it. We also have a load balancer with both hardware and software S uh, SSL offload. Um, and I say hardware offload because we actually have worked with uh, Cavium on being able to work with an adapter in a server and actually use it for a hardware offload. So as far as I think we know, we're the only software appliance vendor that actually leverages hardware offload for SSL offload. Um, and then we have, um, uh, like I said, our appliances. Now, all of this is represented, as, as mentioned, through REST API. Those APIs are published on our website and we have 100% functionality coverage for those services in the context of, of that solution. Okay, so everything is done through the REST API. And then finally, there's a series of, of ways you can, you can interact with the system. Um, the first one I'll mention here, uh, because this is the one we're gonna be using today, is the user interface, the UI, a web-based application that communicates directly with the ESM as well as the appliances. So it manages the life cycle of the appliances, as was mentioned, and it also manages all the policy configuration on our own services. Uh, there's a CLI that's also built into our appliances. That CLI is very Cisco-like, so um, very similar command structure and so forth for managing the firewall and the load balancer. You can certainly write scripts to it, and we also have a plug-in for, for Neutron as well. Yeah. Are these all using the REST API? They all are using the REST API. Okay. Yeah, as a matter of fact, to, to run this, it's a, it's a Python application that you basically point at one of these appliances down here. So you basically run the Python script, you give it the IP address of that appliance, and username and password, and you go in and up pops the CLI. Okay? So everything, and, and that being said, there's only one interface opened on here, which is port 443. 443. There's no SSHing into those or anything like that directly. Okay. okay, so what we're looking at here is the Helios UI, which is our user interface. Uh, it actually comes as part of the system. There's a single OVA. To, to basically build the system, there's one single OVA that you would install, which has both the ESM and the user interface. 
Now, this user interface that we're looking at here can manage one or many ESMs. And you can see them along the side here. We've just got one that's been set up so far. That's, and this is back in, in Santa Clara. But you could have a series of ESMs that are sitting in there, uh, each which has a number of DBAs under management within them. So a single ESM today, we support up to 500 appliances, and then you could have multiple ESMs there. So you can get to a fairly large scale in terms of number of appliances under management. Um, <clears throat> again, this, this UI manages multiple ESMs, but the, the, the ESM and the UI are distributed together as one OVA. Now what we're looking at here is, uh, we're actually giving you a preview of 3.0. We haven't released this yet, but it has the third party lifecycle management, so I want to be able to show you that. So, uh, this is running out of a lab, like I said, in our offices there. Uh, first off, you'll see when we look at the dashboard of the UI, it's been licensed. The, this particular ESM has been licensed for a variety of products, and, and we're going to dive into that in more detail. But one thing I want to point out here is that the license management a function that we do provide is managed through the ESM, and it's based on um, an aggregate number of devices and throughput. So we don't go and license every single appliance individually to a certain scale. Uh, we license, at least for the Embrane specific services, we license a pool of service. So you could say I want 20 gigabits per second worth of firewall and I want 150 instances to go with that. How you divide that bandwidth up and assign it to those appliances and spin those appliances up is completely up to you. It just keeps track of how many are in use and how much bandwidth it is in use and so forth. Now, the license manager that we built into the ESM has a lot of capability. We can get down to licensing individual features and so on and so forth. For our own services, the firewall and the load balancer, we just do the aggregate number of instances, total amount of bandwidth. We offer multiple options to the third parties that we're working with, and some of them have more capabilities than others in terms, to, in terms of adopting them in, in the shorter term. So as an example, you can see in the case of, of the Citrix uh, VPX, we license a number of instances, but there's no limit on bandwidth. Um, and those instances, now this will evolve because this is a new partner for ours. So this is the first iteration of the integration of, of Citrix uh, NetScaler into this product. And as we go forward, they have intentions to take advantage of more uh, features and functionalities of our license uh, manager. So as an example, they could go to the aggregate bandwidth model. They Instead of having the uh, the, the license tiers that they have now are 10 megabit, 100 megabit, 200 megabit, a gigabit, and so forth. They could do an aggregate like we do with our own services and things like that. If we go down to, I'll show you another one in here, um, you can see this base 20 license right here, the Cisco ASAV. Um, that base 20 means it actually, it, it, the number doesn't make a lot of sense, but that is a license for an ASAV that supports four, CP, four vCPUs. So they license, they have a one vCPU, a two, and a three, and a four. That license means that the customer that's installed this license can spin up four instances of a four vCPU virtual firewall. Okay, and again, we would keep track of that. Well, one thing that's important about the licensing is that if, uh, if an appliance is used and then gets uh, deleted from the infrastructure, then the license is returned in the pool and can be reused again. Now, if you've ever tried to, do, to work with licensing with virtual appliances, you know that's not a trivial task. You, you're gonna, most likely, you're going to have to go and request a new key in order to reinstall the, the appliance on a different machine. And I see some heads nodding, so you've probably seen that problem. So this, of course, because of the centralized management system in the SM, takes care of automating all of that. Okay. So let's talk about resources here. Uh, we'll we'll kind of work our way up from the bottom, the core resources, and all the way up through policy. So. As we've shown in that functional uh, diagram, we use virtualized x86 hosts as a core resource. The way we get those resources is we basically go and scan for them. So we have the, the ability here to define what we call a scan, which means that we're basically setting a target, either a single IP address, multiple IP addresses, a full subnet, uh, of servers that are out there that have been prepared for our use. So either they're dedicated to us in the dedicated model that Dante was showing, uh, or they are uh, part of a shared resource that we're going to go in and request some portion of. Could be something under vCenter and so forth. So we would give it a name, we give it a target. The target is basically an IP address, and then we have a series of methods here. So today, as I mentioned, the support for uh, VMware, Xen, and KVM, but we also have a, a unique ability here to uh, talk right directly to the UCS manager. If the, if the server resources are Cisco UCS, we can actually go directly to the UCS manager and learn about the resources through that versus going directly to the UCS themselves. 
And there's a benefit to that. And what it is is we learn the network connectivity. Because the switch is built into that server, we actually learn all the VLAN configuration that's already there. We don't have to set that up ourselves. Now, I'm going to walk through that whole VLAN configuration thing, but just remember there's, there's a, a step that we get to, to bypass here if we talk directly to the UCS manager in the case of a Cisco-based solution. And then the device mediation is essentially user credentials. And you'll see, you can see down in the, the bottom there that actually um, we do some, uh, we, we can set up multiple policies of basically username and password, and we apply that to this scan. So the idea is if you were using a dedicated resource model, you could have a subnet. And every time I put a server in there, I basically boot this thing up on Pixie, put, put a hypervisor on it, set up a username password by default, and then this system will go and rescan that same subnet and pull that server into the pool. And next thing you'll see a, another chunk of resource that's available for us to use. Okay? Now, what we do is in, the, in this, so I've got a couple hosts that we found there. You can see they're, they're uh, ESXi servers. And when we go into those servers, uh, here, I'll pull this up here a bit. Um, you can see we, we learn quite a bit about them. I mean, this is all standard stuff through the API of the hypervisor. But this port, portion here is a one-time configuration detail that we need to do to those servers so that we teach the ESM about the physical network connectivity to these servers. So you can see here that this particular server has six NICs on it, um, and you see the speeds and what up and down and all that sort of thing. But down here at the bottom is the network configuration. So I should explain, to take a bare metal server and put it into the system, you put the hypervisor on it, you put a username and password on it, and you put an IP address on it, and you point the ESM at it. You don't have to go in and configure virtual switching. You don't have to, any of that sort of stuff. The ESM does all of that for us. So down there below, you can see that we can configure port bonding from here. We can set up VLAN trunking on those bonds or individual interfaces. All of that is managed from here. And what you're doing is you're teaching the ESM that this particular server has this connectivity into the physical network uh, through these interfaces and the different VLANs and things that are available there. And then down below, this is sort of a read-only thing, but if we need to create virtual switches, and that sort of thing, the ESM takes care of all of that. You basically train it. Now, this is a sort of a one-time operation that you need to do. You could script this because this is also all API driven. Uh, but when you add a new server, you basically have to teach the ESM how it's connected into the network. Now, in the case, as I mentioned, for UCS Manager, this would all be static. You wouldn't actually be able to change anything here because the UCS Manager has already established the upstream network connectivity from that physical server. We learn it and we use it. Now, the other thing, too, is we're actually doing some work with Cisco on the standalone Nexus 9K, where this will talk directly to the 9K. So if you add a VLAN onto an interface somewhere there, this will learn it as well. So again, you don't have to configure it in two places. It basically learns right. that. Are you learning that? No, this no. is the standalone 9K that would be with the, the NXOS version of software that's available today. The APIC version is a whole different animal in terms of how this communicates with it yeah. because we're not dealing with VLANs at that point. We're dealing with endpoint groups and things really, like that. Really, where do you see your guys competing with APIC? There seems to be a lot of overlap with uh, endpoint orchestration and policy and applying policy. So actually, no, we don't see us competing with APIC. We see these very... Your APIC data center module. Yeah. The, yes, exactly. The, no, no, we see this very complementary to APIC because if you think about everything we do, happens, it happens before the APIC comes into play. Right? So first of all, APIC, APIC to me is at least two things. One is the fabric management component, okay, and that's orthogonal to every, anything we do here. We, we, we work with other fabric management solutions, whether it's a nuage or any other thing. And then there's the policy management, which probably looks closer to this one, and it's probably what you're referring to. Uh, now, the policy management is, is really policy management. We don't really do policy management here. So if you think about the API... So workflow management for uh, existing endpoints, will you be supporting Offflex in later versions of your controller? Yes. The, the, so and Offflex is more of a, of a service. No, no, we'll be supporting... No, no, sorry, sorry. We'll be supporting Offflex on the, on the services because we don't, we don't support Offflex on the controller. Okay. Well, you'll be exposing uh, an API that'll accept uh, EPGs or uh, what's called service chains described within the Offflex protocol definition? That one we're not sure about yet. Okay. Um, right now, the way we're looking, so right now the controller for Opflex is, is APIC. The ESM doesn't have an ambition to be an Opflex controller because the ESM doesn't, con doesn't control the policies of the devices. Once the device is created, the policies belong somewhere else. Let me, let me draw an analogy. 
If you think about vCenter, vCenter doesn't manage the operating system or the applications. Yeah. vCenter stops at the virtual machine being in existence and ensuring that that virtual machine exists according to infrastructure policies defined in vCenter. We are very much analogous to vCenter. If you think about APIC, APIC is more, more something that manages the content of the services. So APIC manages the policies of these services, and in fact, that's why you know, that, that's, if, you, if you come to the, to the booth, we can show you the, the, the demo of the integration with APIC, both in ours and in, in the Cisco booth. This is very complementary. And this is actually very important because... So, uh, can I, can I yeah. say something that, uh, So, are you saying basically you're unifying that kind of topology-based topology -based, based view of uh, management orchestration and diverse, uh, diverse, diverse virtual devices mm -hmm. flowing out there forever, as well as if you've already, if you're managing both policy, policy-based network infrastructure as well as topology-based network infrastructure that you can unify the APIs, unify those all into one set of APIs and management endpoints, management. Controller, I haven't had slept much lately, so. I, I, I think I, I'm not sure. I, I, I completely got, but let me let me let me try I to talk to your API and, and manage the old stuff yes. as well as the new stuff. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. That's yes. that better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's an evolution we're going through on the integration with APIC as well. I mean, the initial in, in instance is there the two entities, the ESM and the APIC, are sort of ships in the night in a sense. Yeah. Except we have the ability to spin up services on the fly and insert them into a network. Um, over time. The intention is is that you, you may not even know the ESM is there. What about consuming other? Uh, what about consuming other uh, application policy centric uh, SDN controllers? Well, again, a lot of the controllers that are out there today for, well, first of all, infrastructure are, are again very heavily focused on layer two. We sit yeah. on top of anything. As a matter of fact, one thing I'm coming to in the demo here is how we actually abstract the networks that we insert these appliances into because we don't necessarily know what that's going to be underneath. I mean. Uh, you know, I've, I've actually taken a very close look at what Nuage does, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no concept of a VLAN there. there. There's a network that has an identity, but we need something to be able to insert appliances into, and, and that could be any Layer 2 construct that's underneath. As we go up the stack, I mean, obviously we can play a, a stronger role in that, but the only policy management piece that we provide today for is for our own appliances that are there. Yeah. Um, you know, who knows where that will go in the future, but, uh, but it's just for our own firewall. Thank you. Question about the, the Cisco relationship that you got here, which is obviously pretty tight. What about other players in the space? Like, could you manage an F5 virtual appliance or yeah. Oh, yeah. SRX? Or so the, there are, there are, so the dimension of the Cisco relationship is primarily in the context of completing the APIC, right? So this is a piece that the APIC does, doesn't have, and so we, 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 have, we work with the APIC there. But the relationship with the network services vendors, there is a relationship with, with Cisco for security, the virtual ASA and the source fire, but we also, we also have a relationship with Citrix for the VPX, with A10, you know, and there are other vendors that we're also having conversations with. I mean, we are building that ecosystem, right? And, and our goal yeah, is to expand. Is, is to broaden the ecosystem. Absolutely. It's yeah. not, you're not going to marry yourself to, to Cisco and focus on that so much as build a big ecosystem. No. No, we, we don't have any particular uh, prefer, preferential uh, relationship with Cisco in any way. Now, clearly, Cisco is the incumbent in networking, and sure. they are driving this architecture. The, the one thing where we things find... Change. Huh? Things change. Though. Things change, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But the, the one thing where we find alignment with Cisco is in the fact that we are, we are both talking to the... You know, we, we both target the, the network teams inside the, you know, the organizations, especially the enterprises. Service providers tend to be slightly different organized. Uh, and so that's where we have a lot of alignment, right? The Cisco model is network centric, our model is network centric. Um, for us becomes, whether, while technologically we work very well also in a, in a VMware NSX environment, um, from an organizational standpoint, that tends to be a, a closer environment to us and it tends to be driven all by VMware and they're still a relatively small ecosystem. So it's a harder play for us. Okay, so what we do with those resources that are discovered is we essentially can pool them together into different compute pools. As an example, you could have a couple, one compute pool in data center A, one in data center B. You, know, you could use that, that construct for a lot of things. We do the same thing with the physical interfaces that are on the servers as well. So we can have some of those that are connected into certain networks and we can pool them together uh, and use them for different purposes. Now, as I mentioned uh, about this abstraction of the networks, um, once we understand what the physical connectivity looks like for those core server resources. We know how many NICs they have, we know what networks they connect into. We then provide an abstraction layer here where we actually map a user-friendly name and, and some details about that on top of those, whatever those network constructs are underneath. So in this case here, 
you can see that we've mapped a series of names here to VLANs because this is a model that's leveraging VLANs. But if those are VXLANs underneath, if those are port groups underneath, or if those are some other layer two construct down the road, the mapping and where the appliance actually connects into doesn't change because those network names on the left hand side there are actually what you use when you define and spin up an appliance. You don't say I, put, I want to put it in VLAN 1421, you say I want to put it in OOB, which in this case is out of band for something else, but anyway. Um, so we use those naming constructs. So we can change what, what the mapping is underneath and the appliance itself hasn't changed. Now you'll notice some of these have IP address, IP pool, uh, address pools here. Uh, for certain networks like the management network, the management interface of these virtual appliances, we actually can manage the IP addresses of those. So we will allocate those, we can assign a pool there. We also use a couple networks for in-band and out-of-band. The in-band is used for the distributed appliance model, which I'm not going to go into. Actually, the last time I think we met with you, we spent quite a bit of time on that. It's not as used that much these days, um, but it is, that's, it's sort of an internal network that we use to stitch together that. And the out-of-band is actually used for HA. It is the network when we spin up a pair of appliances and stitch them together. It's the network that's used for heartbeat and, and uh, config synchronization and so forth. So again, we can have a long list of these sort of things, but they map through to some sort of layer two construct that's underneath that, um, <clears throat> and, and so forth. Now, uh, before we go in and actually spin one of these up, uh, we also have, uh, as, as Dante was mentioning, we're working, the only one that's not here that, that we have in, in another setup in the lab is A10. We actually have that uh, going as well. But as you can see here, we load up the virtual, the OVAs of these appliances into the ESM, and then from there we can spin them up into the network. So we have our own load balancer and firewall, we have the virtual ASA, um, the source fire uh, piece as well, as well as the uh, Citrix Nest scale. The, the, the other thing you can do here, you can manage multiple versions of yeah. the same service. So if you're in an environment, again, if you spin up hundreds of these things and you are, you are in the process of doing an upgrade, you may not want to upgrade the old thing at the same time, which is exactly what you have to do when you have shared physical devices. So this allows you to deal also with multiple versions and keep track of those and so on. Now, taking one step up from that, we also virtualize the ESM. So we can take, so the ESM now has a pool of resources. It has these virtual servers. It knows about a, a series of networks that it can insert appliances into. <clears throat> we can also take a portion of that ESM resource and assign it to what we call a project. So a project has a series of administrators and operators uh, and roles associated with that. And then a series of resources down here that you can see where um, we give it a series of networks as well as a compute pool. So we can say, okay, for this particular user, uh, they get access to this compute pool. They can only insert uh, appliances into those networks. And as a matter of fact, what we've implemented in 3.0 here, which we'll be releasing as a quota system as well, to say they can only create three appliances, they can only use these versions, they can do things like that. So again, it's sort of a, uh, it's a virtualization of the ESM. Uh, a dev test, uh, an automated de uh, self-service dev test would be a good example of this in the enterprise where you could say, yeah. you know, here's, here's your username and, and password, go in there, and if you log in as one of these administrators, you won't see everything on the left-hand side there. You would just see your ESM, your pool of resources, and your networks, and you could go build virtual appliances and insert them into the networks and that sort of thing. So again, it's a virtualization of the ESM. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, <clears throat> spin up an appliance. So to create an appliance, as you saw, I went through the step of defining the resources, abstracting the resources, pooling them together in the ESM. <clears throat> now we're actually going to build an appliance. So the first thing we're going to do is choose an image. Now, for, the, <clears throat> for our own services, there's a different set of options that we're going to see here than for the third-party services because um, when we go and work with third-party, the ESM does a lot of things, but depending on what the third-party appliance is, it may be better or less suited to actually uh, adapt all of the capability of the ESM in its first go around. So we're gonna add more capability here. As an example, we manage HA for the ASAV with Cisco, but right now with the Citrix um, VPX, we don't do HA today. Uh, that's something that's, that's slotted for the, for the future. So let's, let's spin up an Embrane one first, and we'll go back and do another one, uh, a third party one. So we pick the image, uh, we pick the class, the small and medium, this is the, the small is a single virtual machine appliance. The medium is a distributed virtual machine appliance. We didn't get into that today. That's probably a longer conversation, um, but it's essentially we can spin up a bunch of VMs and stitch them together as one big distributed appliance. <clears throat> so we'll go with the small on this one. We give it a name. So we'll just give it, give it a name. And now we look here and we look at the projects that we want to insert this into. Now I'm logged in as sort of a super administrator. 
I see all the projects there. If you logged in as a project administrator, you would only see you wouldn't even see this as a selection because you'd be assigned to a single project. <clears throat> HA or not? Now, what we do with HA is by checking that box, the ESM will go and deploy two appliances. It'll look to make sure that these appliances are on separate physical servers. If they can't be put on separate physical servers, it'll actually flag it. And and once you correct the system, the scenario, it'll go back in there and, and deploy them. Will it uh, uh, build, if it's VSphere, will it build the uh, anti-affinity rules in DRS? It, it, say it Anti-affinity rules in DRS? <laughs> no, actually, when, it, when we actually deploy into an environment that has DRS turned on, it'll actually request, it'll set the flag to say no DRS. We don't want vSphere moving these appliances around on us because they could put them anywhere and we wouldn't even see where they went. So we actually request no, no DRS and we request no HA. The ESM makes the decision on what server that, that appliance is going to go to. It does know how much of the resources are being used within these servers. Um, and in terms of HA, when we check this box, it spins up the two appliances and synchronizes them together. So the, the, the HA model here is more of a traditional networking appliance HA model where we exchange state and configuration and so forth versus doing something that's more vMotion-like, which would apply to an application. Yeah, I'm curious why, I mean, like that's the config sync, that's kind of standard stuff. I'm just curious why you opted to do basically disable DRS and not. Well, the reason is, is because this compute pool could have a server in it, KVM, a server in it that's Zen server, and a, and a server in it that's vSphere. We tried to go for the lowest common denominator functionality and then rebuild this more from a network-centric perspective. Exactly. You're right, if it was a VMware-only environment, we certainly could use that and, and tie in for that. Yeah. So, yeah. And so anyway, we'll go ahead and we'll spin this up. Throughput, again, this is licensed on aggregate, so we could set that number to anything. The compute pool, what compute pool do we want to put this in? <clears throat> and then here's where we can actually go in and add interfaces. So if we, you know, depending on what sort of configuration we want for this particular appliance, we can tie it into different networks. Now this is a step here. I've gone through actually deploying, as an example, uh, uh, the Citrix VPX. The OVA comes with two interfaces deployed on it. So to deploy it into the network, you actually have to spin it up. Then you have to shut it down so that you can add the interface and then spin it back up. We do all this uh, from the get-go. Uh, you'll tie this into a management network, so the management network for, for the appliance itself. And then at this point, we basically can say add. Now, what the ESM is doing is it's going out to the server pool. Now, this is a small implementation here, so it's going to pick the first server that has the resources. It'll, it'll actually install an image there. It'll spin up the appliance, and it'll tie it into the network. So this is just sort of the basics, building up the system and then spinning up an appliance. Now, for things like the ASAV, I can show you one here that's actually up and running just because it takes a few minutes to spin one up. So you can see it assigns a management address. This one actually is in an HA configuration. Uh, it shows you, the, you know, where the two instances are that are tied together and so on and so forth. Again, with the Citrix VPX, we don't do this, the HA component of this yet, but that is something that, that they want to adopt uh, as another function that the ESM manages for them and so forth. So any questions on that? I just know that we're getting pretty close to the time there. Any questions on, on what you saw here? Thoughts? Is this uh, something you find that uh, in, in your own customers that you're working with? That, uh, first of all, the adoption of uh, virtual appliances, what sort of uh, things are you seeing? Are you seeing customers moving towards virtual appliances, maybe from physical, or are you seeing as virtual appliances being added as sort of another layer on, in addition to physical that, that's there? Any thoughts around that? I've, I've seen a few VCS deployments. I think the, that and similar products are really sort of, sort of greasing the wheels. Um, prior to that, no, I've not seen much, but I think we're seeing a bigger, bigger uptake in, in virtual appliances. That are managed, right? Right. standalone. I mean, that's been kind of cool for a while. Actually, you know, managed and integrated with other stuff. Did you have UCS stuff to show? Because I'm, I'm curious no. to see that. Uh, not in this particular okay. pod that we're using at the office there, awesome. but yeah. yeah. So in this particular case, like I said, you point to the UCS. The only difference, really, between what you see here and with the UCS manager, is that in that network connect, that physical network connectivity page for each server, all the information there would be static. Uh, other than that, everything else here would be exactly the same. Okay. I think I see some grappling around with the concept of physical virtual versus virtual appliance, mm -hmm. and at least, and maybe it's an East Coast thing, but I think the customer base, uh, some fall in love with the virtual appliances, but are maybe not thinking about performance characteristics mm -hmm. and trade-offs. Yeah. So it's still a learning curve. 
Yeah. No, you're right. And the, the big thing is that in, a, in the virtual appliance world, the use cases are different, right? So many people tend to think about virtual as a one-for-one -one replacement of a physical, and that's wrong. Because if you do that, your physical is so much easier to manage, why do it in the first place? The big benefit of virtual is that you can have a much larger number of instances, so you can become a lot more granular in who you give that instance to. But now that requires these, that requires also the other big problem right now is the licensing models. You know, the, the, the licensing model of many of the existing virtual appliance solution is consistent with physical. So you have the one gig, the two gig, the 10 gig, but you know, here you, you need a different model. Imagine if uh, VMware was licensing uh, virtualization on a per virtual machine basis where you have to buy individual virtual machines and per each one of them you have to specify you know, how many virtual CPUs you need, what kind of memory, what kind of I.O. characteristics, and which physical server you're going to run it on. Now, this is exactly how you buy virtual appliances today. But clearly, it doesn't scale. With this model, you can scale. So, you know, it, the good news is that now we have these partnerships and we, you know, we're going we're gonna to help these vendors also uh, make it more, more scalable and deployable. And I think that's going to get more traction. Definitely lots of interest because of the reasons why you want to have that flexibility. Yeah. I think there's a large base of customers out there that don't really understand the flows in their data center. And so I'm running into phenomenon. The latest battle, which has existed for about a year, is the very big physical firewall in the middle, which is the default gateway for absolutely everything. And if you strap that onto, say, a Nexus switch, which has vastly more performance, that's just kind of an odd decision from my point of view. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of this is, it is really education, and that's why we're interested in uh, talking to you guys, hearing from you guys, of course. Uh, but the biggest challenge we see is education, because when you talk to somebody who's tried to do these things, they, they immediately relate with what you're talking about. But you, when you talk in general to audiences, as I was sharing earlier on, you know, how many of you are using virtual appliances? You get all kinds of reactions, right? And, and some of those are just based on um, misunderstandings. Yeah, so, nice. sorry, go ahead. My sense is that there are a lot of uh, VMware administrators that are stuck, sort of stuck out there on VMware 1.0. They mm -hmm. stood up VMs, they don't really use vMotion, they over-provision the virtual machines, they don't clone them, they build each one individually as you suggested. Yeah. And so just changing that mindset to leverage automation and stop doing the same thing over and over again repetitively um, is a big step for them. Correct. Any context around uh, using like the, the virtual appliance layer 4 through 7 stuff as a classification mechanism. So like with the endpoint groups, with APIC, right? You can't really, I mean, if you're in the virtual context, like AVS, I think it can only do, I think up to TCP maybe. I don't, I don't even know if that's true. I think it's, I think it's even less granular. Yeah. But it could, I mean, is there any, any, any value you guys see in maybe using the virtual appliances to do some sort of like inspection at, at the layer 7 boundary? And then based off of information, like I see this HTTP header come up, therefore you are an endpoint group, but yeah. I, so, so I, I see what you're saying, and I think there is value, because the benefit here is that you can have a much more distributed model, so you can overcome the performance bottleneck problem, because you can, you can locate it closer, for example, to the endpoints. Uh, it's not necessarily what we do, because it gets more into the policy management, into the function. If you, if you look at this presentation, how much did we talk about our services? We didn't, we didn't tell you how many VIPs we support, how many connections per second. I mean, the, the point for us is not so much what the service does or what the policies are on the service. It's more about how do we get these services deployed in a scalable manner in a virtual form factor. That's the problem we want to solve, right? So what you're talking about is valid. I completely agree. And these type of deployments and manageability can help deploy these solutions, but that becomes more of a function uh, problem, challenge. Thank you guys. Now we do have